Hello friends, in today's video we're going to be talking about the ecology of human performance model also known as the EHP model. We'll go through what the key concepts and constructs within this model is. And we'll talk about how we can memorize it by showing a quick visual at the end. It'll really break it down, make it easy to remember and hopefully apply when you're out in practice or just working on a case in grad school. This is the second video in a series of videos where we're going over the differences and similarities of major occupational therapy models. Here's a quick list of the models that I'm covering in this video series. The models include the person, environment, and occupation model, the Canadian model of occupational performance and engagement, the ecology of human performance model, which is the one we'll go over today, the occupational adaptation model, the COW model, and the model of human occupation. There's two key questions that I personally use to distinguish these models that help me to know their unique strengths and uses so that I can pick the best one for whatever case I'm working on. The first question is, what is the desired outcome? For example, is the case or client suggesting that their desired outcome in therapy is occupational performance, or is it access to meaningful occupations, or is it increasing their sense of well-being? The second question is, what's the balance of person, environment, and occupational factors that the case or client is talking about the most? If your initial interaction or overview of the medical chart is clearly talking about lacking skills such as motor or processing skills or is talking a lot about person factors then you know you need a model that looks in great detail at the person. However, a case that talks more significantly about contextual or environmental factors that are impacting the client will need a model that can provide a rich perspective and framework for understanding environments. So the balance of these factors helps to cue us about the type of model we need in order to understand occupational performance or some aspect of occupation. Now the ecology of human performance model is a great well-rounded model that shares overlap with PEO and CMOP-E, but it does have some unique things that help to to distinguish it. In the last model, we discussed that the PO model focused on occupational performance and the CMOP-E focused on occupational performance plus occupational engagement. Well, EHP focuses on occupational performance and occupational performance range. So when we are working with a case where the client wants to increase their occupational performance range or you feel like that would be a good outcome based on off of what the client is talking about, then this model would be a good one to consider. The way it conceptualizes occupational performance range is that it looks at how the person interacts dynamically with the context and vice versa, how the context affects the person. The person in context interaction either increases or decreases the range of tasks that the person can do. Now the range of tasks that fall within what the person can do makes up the occupational performance range. We'll go through a visual example in a little bit that will hopefully make it a little bit more concrete for you. Let's talk about what this model assesses. It uses what I call the PCT. It stands for person, context, and task. Let's break these down. The person in this model is similar in a lot of ways to the PO model and can be broadly simplified to mean the intrinsic factors that the person has, including skills, body and mental functions, and so forth. However, this model has an added emphasis on the person in context. So this adds an extra layer to our understanding that a person doesn't just find themselves in an external context. Even their lived experiences and who they are as a person intrinsically has a phenomenological context that is important to consider. The second factor that it assesses is context. The main thing to note in context is it adds temporal Temporal context as a context which PEO and CMOP-E didn't explicitly state. Other than that, EHP also includes similar environments under context as what was listed in other models which includes physical, cultural, and social environments. The third thing that EHP assesses is the construct of tasks. EHP uses the term tasks which are components of occupational roles. So the way to conceptualize is that Groups of tasks make up occupational roles. And once you see the visual of this, I think it'll make a lot of sense. It's really intuitive. And the range of tasks that a person can do expresses whether or not a person is able to fulfill their occupational roles and their meaningful occupations. Let's look at this model visually real quick using the same example that we used in our PO model example in our previous video. Here we have Joey the cyclist. Um, and on the left, you'll see him pre-injury. On the right, post-injury. So let's look at how EHP conceptualizes him. So we talked about 
about PCT, the person, contacts, and tasks. You'll see those listed here at the bottom. So for the person, again, these are mostly intrinsic factors with kind of the added emphasis of context. So you'll see that he's social, athletic, smart, and confident. Now, the person is always going to be within context. He has a supportive family, a supportive girlfriend. He lives in a second floor apartment, which just works for him. One of the key things about this is the way that he even perceives his tasks and his meaningful occupations is going to be through context. So context really affects the person significantly. So you'll see here within blue is going to be conceptualized the occupational performance range. The total occupational performance range is kind of this blue line here. Anything that falls within kind of this triangular looking area is our tasks that he can accomplish. So piano, for example, falls outside of that occupational performance range and is something that he, he doesn't do or can't do. So this circle here signifies an occupational role of Joey. So for Joey, he is a salesperson and emailing, calling, ironing, driving, and doing meetings are all tasks that essentially are part of his, his occupational role. Now let's look at Joey the cyclist after his cycling accident where he experiences a C4 spinal cord injury. You'll see now that the context has shrunk around the person. The person, Joey, is still social. He's smart, but maybe now is fearful and again has a C4 spinal cord injury, which will leave him with motor and potentially sensory deficits. Now for context, he still has family and his girlfriend, but his second floor apartment is not conducive to his occupational performance range and, and helps to really shrink this along with obviously his significant injury. You'll see that piano is still out of his occupational performance range. Now other things has fallen out such as cleaning, cycling, ADLs, cooking, and even some of those important work tasks that he was able to do before he can't. He might still be able to hang out to a limited degree, he might still be able to make calls with some assistance. So, so some of those things are still falling within his occupational performance range. But again, you'll see this is significantly diminished. I also want to highlight a couple of unique contributions specific to EHP that other models do not address. EHP has specific intervention strategies built within its model which allows it to be used as both a model of practice and as a frame of reference. Essentially, the model outlines five intervention strategies that an OT can choose from. The first strategy is that you can establish a new skill or restore a skill that was lost. This strategy focuses on treating person factors. In the case of Joey, the focus of some interventions may be to restore active range of motion of any of the muscles that may still have neurological connection to the brain, such as working on re-engaging some of his diaphragmatic muscles to establish deeper breathing and more effective breathing. So that would be restoring a skill that he had pre-injury. Secondly, you can alter the environment. This would mean focusing on choosing a different context that is a better fit for the client's current abilities. This one is a little bit tricky to differentiate when compared to the next strategy, which is adapting. But the key thing to remember is that when choosing to alter context, you are intentionally placing a person in a completely different context so that the context matches their current skills. So let's look at a case for Joey in which we'll alter the environment. For example, we know that he lives on the second floor apartment building. Say he doesn't have an elevator access or any other easy access for a wheelchair. So the OT might work with him to say, why don't we move you in with a family member that has a single story home. You don't need a ramp to get in. And so there you go. It's plug and play. It matches his current skill level. And so that would be an example of altering the context. Thirdly, you can adapt the task that the person is trying to engage in, or you can adapt the context that the person is in. This is different than altering the context because in adapting the OT is changing the current context to match and support the client's abilities. You're not putting the person in a completely different context. So for Joey, this might mean that an OT helps him change the way he completes sales. So instead of doing face-to-face -face meetings, they do Zoom calls instead. Or the OT might provide adaptive equipment to support his use of technology for work. These are both examples of adapting strategy. Fourth is a prevention strategy, which is focused on preventing negative outcomes for the client. This strategy can use the person, context, or task to prevent negative outcomes. In Joey's case, this might look like having him do weight shifts regularly, which is a prevention strategy for skin breakdown. If an OT wanted to do a contextual prevention strategy, they may get a Rojo cushion instead. Both of these will help to prevent the negative outcome of skin breakdown. The fifth strategy is create. This focuses on providing the client with new opportunities to express and engage in meaningful occupations. New opportunities can be created by focusing 
focusing intervention either on context or tasks. In Joey's case, this may mean teaching him a different sport, such as introducing him to a power soccer league that is local. This allows him different opportunities, such as practicing different skills within his wheelchair, increasing his cardiopulmonary capacity, which without this new context, he wouldn't have the opportunity or the affordances to increase those skills and different adaptive responses. The second unique contribution of the EHP model that I really love is the fact that it talks about changing systems, which essentially gives individuals more access to their rights. This lays the foundation for the concept that we now understand to be occupational justice. And what a cool thing to think that we are able as occupational therapists to be a part of changing these systems in order to allow individuals with disabilities or challenges to have a greater access to their rights as occupational human beings. All right, let's make it visual and draw this out and make it super simple so that we can remember all these important aspects of the model. Here's the visual breakdown of the EHP model. Remember the two outcomes that I feel like this is particularly good for is occupational performance and occupational performance range. The things that it looks at and assesses is the person, the context, and the task, and then the interaction between person, context, and task. So the person is seen as the intrinsic factors of the person, but also there's kind of this emphasis on person in context so that there's a phenomenological perspective here and a lived experience is part of who the person is and context is everything in this model. The person even perceives the rest of his world kind of through the lens of context. Temporal context, physical context, social context, and cultural context are the subcategories of context in this model. And then it uses the verbiage task instead of occupation. Here's just the visual breakdown. You know it. we walked through it with Joey. You've got PCT, you've got your occupational performance range. Anything within this or any task within this performance range is good to go. The person can do it. Anything outside of that performance range is what they're going to have difficulty with and then groups of these tasks can be grouped to form occupational roles hopefully their occupational roles is within their occupational performance range if not obviously that's going to be a problem and that's going to be something we want to address in intervention that brings us to our intervention strategy so here we've got five strategies that we just want to touch on you know these it's establish and restore targeting person factors or particularly skills that a person may have lost or that maybe a child needs to gain then there's altering which is about changing the context completely so that the skill level of the person matches the context with modify and adapt you're going to be focusing on contextual and task factors and this is about modifying the current task or context four is prevent which is targeting person context and task and essentially is all about preventing negative outcomes. And with number five, the create strategy, you can target context and task. And this is all about creating opportunities for the person to have adaptive responses uh, in a new context or with a new task so they can build new skills or to have opportunities to live out new occupational roles. I've got this little mnemonic here that's straightforward. ERs always actively prevent catastrophes, establish and restore, alter, adapt, prevent, and create. Finally, just want to make the note of occupational justice and the fact that that this model recognizes that by changing systems, individuals can access their rights as occupational beings. Thank you so much for joining me on the OT Minute today. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing and turning on the notification bell so that you are kept up to date regarding new OT related content coming out on this channel. Please share and post this video and I'll see you in the next video.